Well, hello, everybody. Have you missed me? I have not been on uh, YouTube. I haven't been making any YouTube videos for a while. I've been really just engrossed in, in teaching and research at my university. But I am brought out of hibernation today because of a video that I just saw that was put up by Dr. John Campbell yesterday that is just absolute nonsense. And, it's, and it infuriates me because of the way he is in this video. I mean, I don't, I don't think he's stupid and I don't think he's ignorant. Um, and I kind of wish I thought he was one or the other of those because the other choice here is uh, mendacious and taking advantage of the ignorance of his viewers. Um, at any rate, he had a video yesterday um, on vaccination and multiple sclerosis, which is just was just a font of misinformation and um, intrigue. And yeah, why don't we uh, spend a little time uh, walking through that? Okay, well, if you're new here or if you have a short memory and uh, don't remember why you subscribe to this channel, I'm Greg Tucker Keller, Prof. Greg on this channel, and I'm a, uh, a biology professor in Singapore, and I have this YouTube channel to both discuss issues in biotech and bioinformatics and more recently to discuss uh, issues with uh, coronavirus and, uh, 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 and misinformation, scientific misinformation. Um, and so I want to start with a clip from John Campbell's video. So this is just the first minute. I'm going to play the first minute of his video from yesterday. Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Monday, the 29th of May. Now, last week, the World Health Organization put out a release uh, showing that there was a possible causal relationship between COVID-19 vaccine and multiple sclerosis. And we're allowed to report on this because it is an official WHO paper. We're limited to other things we can report, but we can report this. Now, this is the paper here. Now, um, it says COVID-19 vaccination can induce multiple sclerosis via cross-reactivity with T helper cells. So quite an admission from the World Health Organization. Now, this isn't available on quite a few servers now, but I've uh, got DuckDuckGo on my, um, on my lap, um, desktop so I, I could find it again. But that's, that's, that's it there. And it, it is, as I say, WHO publication, so we can actually talk about this. Nice to be able to talk about things. Now, what is this actually uh, showing? Okay, so I know that was an exciting first minute of video. Let's talk about the claims that he made in that video. I've, uh, I've listened to that first minute a few times, and I've gone through it. So let's, uh, I'm, I'm using quotes for everything that he said, all the major claims, all the things that he said, only in the first 60 seconds. Okay, first, last week, the World Health Organization put out a release showing that there was a possible causal relation between COVID-19 vaccine and multiple sclerosis. His second claim, we're allowed to report on this because it's an official WHO paper. Third claim, it says, the paper says, his words, COVID vaccination can induce multiple sclerosis via cross-reactivity with T helper cells. So quite an admission from the World Health Organization, so says John Campbell. This isn't available on quite a few servers. And then he goes on with some uh, discussion of DuckDuckGo. And finally, all he could get in in that first minute was it is, as I say, a WHO publication, so we can actually talk about this. Okay, so let's review those claims. The first, last week, the World Health Organization put out a release showing that there was a possible causal relation between COVID-19 vaccine and multiple sclerosis. This single sentence contains two falsehoods. It wasn't last week, and it wasn't a, actually three things. It wasn't last week, it wasn't uh, a, a release, and it wasn't the World Health Organization. That goes into the second one. We're allowed to report on this because it's an official WHO paper. No, it is not an official WHO paper. It has nothing to do with the WHO. It isn't even really a paper, as we'll get into later, and you'd be allowed to report on it even if, and you're still allowed to report on it. It's not, just doesn't have anything to do with the WHO. It says COVID-19 vaccination can induce multiple sclerosis via cross-reactivity with T helper cells. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. 
Uh, so quite an admission from the World Health Organization. Well, it would be maybe, maybe if it had anything to do with them, but it doesn't. So it's not. Uh, this isn't available on quite a few servers. John, I'm sorry you're having trouble with your internet, but that's, uh, I, I don't even know where that comes from. I th actually, I think I do. I think that comes from just your misunderstanding or at least misrepresenting to your viewers what this paper is. I say misrepresented be misrepresenting because you've been a nurse and a nurse educator for so long, it would surprise me if you didn't know how this worked. Okay, but yeah, I'm, I'm willing to be surprised. It is, as I say, a WHO publication, so we can actually talk about this. Well, no, and also no. So it's not a WHO publication, and you could still talk about it, and you can still talk about it, and you are still talking about it, even though it's not a WHO publication. Okay, so let's let John, Dr. John Campbell, introduce this paper just a little bit more. So that's what seems to be happening, and that's reporting on this paper. So if you can't find it on Safari or something, do do try DuckDuckGo, because that's where I got it. I actually started to prep this uh, about three days ago, and when I went and clicked on it this morning, it just wasn't there. You know, one of those can't find it sort of make messages. Anyway, let's look at it in a little more detail now because it's a pretty significant paper. And it's not only showing what this, this particular autoimmune reaction is to multiple sclerosis, but is there other autoimmune reactions? Well, the one I'm allowed to talk about is, is this one because it's a WHO publication. Um, you get the impression it's probably been taken down from some other servers, um, but hey, what do I know? Okay, there is so much intrigue and... Other stuff going on in that um, uh, that little bit by Dr. Campbell. Um, I'm sorry, his internet isn't working very well. He seems to think that it requires DuckDuckGo to, uh, to get to, that it's being taken down, that he can only talk about it because it's a WHO official thing. Um, how does, where does that come from? So I went to the link that uh, Dr. Campbell provided for this paper. Here it is. And uh, you might recognize the WHO logo up here, uh, but you might not at first because you might notice that this is in Portuguese. Uh, and there is a reason. There is a reason it's in Portuguese. Let's switch for the purposes of this video to English. And uh, so here we see, yes, World Health Organization database. But what it is, is it's not the publication that is, has anything to do with the WHO. This is a database hosted by something called the uh, the BVS, um, which uh, from Portuguese translates into basically the, uh, the virtual health library. Um, and it's hosted in Brazil. So Brazil sets up this database to uh, uh, under the umbrella of the WHO. So it is working uh, under the auspices of the WHO to set up this database of publications related to COVID-19 research. But they're not WHO publications. They have nothing to do with WHO. They're just publications, but they're not just publications. They're conference, uh, information from conferences, local, regional, uh, international conferences, all kinds of things that might not make it into PubMed. And even if they did make it into PubMed, the WHO is very, uh, one of their uh, one of the things they focus on is the developing world. So why should everything be in English? And so uh, resources that they have tend to be wisely multilingual. In this case, also hosted in Brazil, in Portuguese, and a lot of other languages here. And uh, and that's why it's there. And if we look at the paper itself, at the, the, the thing itself, um, we can see here, let's go down here, that in fact, you can tell already it's, it was published in the Multiple Sclerosis Journal. What? That has nothing to do with the WHO. It's not a WHO thing. Uh, the article's in English. Volume 28, it's in an issue called Three Supplement. Let's see what that means. Page 776 and 2022. So, back to Dr. Campbell's original claims. Nothing happened last week. This thing has been out since 2022. It's not a WHO uh report. It's not a WHO circular. It's not a WHO anything other than it happens to be in this 
database that the WHO has for all kinds of research uh, that is related to COVID-19. They're not behind it. They're, they're not, they don't put their stamp of, you know, they're not stamping it and saying, this is research you can trust. It's just research they've collected. So uh, it has an ID. It says the ID, maybe this is what threw Dr. Campbell off because the ID is COVID WHO 213-8820. But in fact, it turns out every single article or conference abstract or any item in this, all of the uh, items have an entry that begins COVID WHO. That's just something, that's something a database designer did has nothing to do with the research itself. Let's go find this journal, Multiple Sclerosis Journal. Okay, so I've already done that. It's in another tab. Here it is. It's published by a publisher called Sage Journals. Perfectly respectable publisher. Uh, here it is. It's a peer-reviewed international journal that focuses on all aspects of multiple sclerosis and other related autoimmune diseases of the central nervous system. So, uh, we can go to different, um, uh, you know, the most recent, the most read, and so on. But we know where this is, so why don't we go to all issues? We know it was in 2022. And now we can see the issues, and this is where we'll see what that supplement thing is. Remember, the paper, or the, the, the thing in question, was published in Volume 28, which is 2022, and it was in something called Three Supplement. Page 776. So we can see here that volume 28 has actually 14 issues and four supplements. Three supplement was in October. Each of the supplements corresponds to a meeting. So you can see this fourth supplement is MS Australia Progress in MS Research. So it's an Australia meeting, 45 pages. So the supplement is only 45 pages. Uh, these other ones here, for example, this one here, the International Multiple Sclerosis Cognition Society meeting, Bordeaux, France, 20 pages. Uh, and this other one in May, this um, ACTRIMS forum, 224 pages. Clearly, the largest here is Supplement 3, uh, which is 1,057 pages from something called ECTRIMS. So before we get to the paper... Um, let's ask, what is what is this? So this is a meeting. This is an annual meeting called ECTRIMS. This is the Congress of the European Committee for Treatment and Research in Multiple Sclerosis. It advertises itself um, clearly, accurately, as the largest multiple sclerosis conference in the world, runs every year. In 2022, it had 9,000 participants from 100 com countries, 200 speakers, and 1,700 abstracts. Those were on, on posters or e-posters. Lots of information. If you want to see what it looks like, if you had walked into it, it would look, well, so the basic meeting would look something like this. Uh, you walk in, there's a big convention center. Some of uh, these big clinical meetings are like this, big convention center. Uh, and here saying, you know, the world's largest meeting in MS. And it has... Uh, of course, they have speakers, so they have lecture theaters and auditoriums, and then they have smaller rooms uh, for uh, some specialized sessions. And then they'll have poster sessions, which look a lot like this. So this is actually a poster session from that meeting, uh, and it was on uh, the, the meeting's Twitter page when, when they were um, uh, talking about that meeting last year. At any rate, this is what it looks like. It, a poster session is just what it says. It's a bunch of posters. Everybody gets an easel or some sort of uh, standee um, that you you uh, set up and you, you bring in a poster. If you fly to a city that's having a big medical conference, you'll often see people with these rolled up posters in um, uh, kind of, you know, art, what look like they may be carrying art or doing archery or something. I mean, it's, it, it's very typical to see these things. Uh, and uh, people do a lot of work on them. These are really to discuss with other experts. So that it's, they're often work in progress, work that hasn't yet been submitted to a journal, uh, work that you're thinking about and you're trying to position and understand better yourself. That's a very common thing. 
Um, and it's also often an opportunity for people who might not have the opportunity to speak at a conference to nonetheless go to a conference and share their work with other people and, uh, and have those other people come back in and provide some critique and feedback. Okay, why is that relevant? So if we go here to this issue, let's look in that issue, supplement issue, and well, it's a big one, so there's lots of different things. So there's committees, there's a PDF on abstracts with oral presentations, there's one with a poster session, and then there's one with e-posters. So if we look back at the, at the uh, supplement, at the, the info, the bibliographic info, we can see that this was on page 776 of that supplement, which is, means it was an e-poster. So an e-poster is a lot like a poster session, but not as fun because e-posters, instead of people doing really artistic things on a physical poster in an e-poster session, typically you're given a kind of a large screen and you present your work on a poster on the screen instead of on a physical thing. Um, and uh, I just, I don't know, maybe I'm nostalgic. I personally like the physical posters. Okay, let's go find this poster. So here we have it. Uh, we'll go to the e-posters, we can download that. Download the PDF. Oh, it's giving me the EPUB, doesn't matter. Okay, here we go. And let's go, um, oh, maybe I already found it. So I, I'm gonna find it by author. There's a lot of them. I'm gonna use the second author's name because it looks like it is gonna be harder to find, Batruk. So if I search Batruk, find it. So this is now, um, and let's get rid of that stuff so we can see it more clearly. This is now the entire thing, okay? Uh, and so you can see it has nothing to do with the WHO. University Hospital in Zurich, Switzerland, um, a bunch of different people. Uh, Batruk is probably the person presenting because uh, their name is underlined. Uh, and this is the entire thing. So the whole thing is just a couple of short, a few short paragraphs, introduction, objectives. We report here two cases of multiple sclerosis with clinical and new radiological signs beginning in close temporal relation to spike as protein mRNA vaccinations. Um, and so their aim is to establish that the onset of these cases is likely caused by this. Now here I'm going to pause and I... Uh, and I'm gonna go back to Dr. Campbell because I wanna highlight um, something that he presented from the same text. And I wanna discuss uh, something that's different. So let's do that. Uh, now, this is the paper here. Uh, COVID-19 vaccination can induce, now this is, the, this is the WHO, so can induce multiple sclerosis via cross-reactive T helper uh, cell, CD4 hell, cells, recognizing SARS coronavirus to spike protein, and as we've said, myelin, this essential myelin that protects the cells in the central nervous system. Now, the article goes on uh, both natural infection and mRNA vac based vaccinations can be accompanied by transient autoimmune phenomena. Now, this is pretty significant in itself because here we have the WHO uh, actually admitting that uh, SARS coronavirus 2 vaccines can cause autoimmune phenomena. This is actually a pretty big uh, breakthrough. Um, let, let's hope this paper stays up because it really is quite a groundbreaking piece. And I am live from the WHO website now via DuckDuckGo. Uh, uh, and uh, and um, I can't remember the search engine now, but it's DuckDuckGo anyway. Um, do let me know if you find it on other search engines because I've had difficulty. Um, so onset of autoimmune disease confirmed by the World Health Organization. Well, good morning. I said I wanted to take a break. I did take a break. I went to bed. It's the morning. I'm refreshed. I have my coffee. So let's pick up where we left off, which was at this point here where Dr. Campbell is uh, presenting a bit out of the first passage of the abstract of this e-poster from the meeting in Amsterdam last year. Uh, so let's actually look at the poster itself, the text of the poster itself, poster abstract. Um, and here we are. 
So what we see is uh, they start off, infection with the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus can lead to a wide range of acute and also chronic disease manifestations. No argument. They go on. The rapidly developed vaccinations are highly effective in preventing severe disease courses and have been proven safe. Now, you might think, wow, that is something that Dr. Campbell didn't mention, and maybe that's something he should have mentioned because it seems counter to the message that he uh, says uh, a little bit later. Um, but I want to highlight not that sentence so much, but the next sentence. And I'll do that on the next slide. Uh, so on this slide, what I want to do is compare the sentence as it appears in the abstract and the sentence as it appears in Dr. Campbell's quotation of it. So here it is from Tio Batrukadol. Both natural infection and, to a much lesser extent, the mRNA-based vaccinations uh, can be accompanied by transient autoimmune phenomena. When Dr. Campbell quotes the passage, he does it like this. Both natural infection and the mRNA-based vaccinations can be accompanied by transient autoimmune phenomena. He leaves out, without any indication, no ellipsis, no note, he, leads out, he leaves out that, that critical uh, qualifier to a much lower extent. What the authors are doing is saying quite clearly that natural infection causes this or lead, is associated with this, and mRNA vaccination may also be associated with it, but less often or less severely, I guess it depends to a much, what is meant by to a much lower extent, could be both. Uh, what it definitely means is that they're not equivalent. Dr. Campbell's removal of that passage without any indication would lead one to interpret that they are equivalent, at least as far as the authors are opening their piece with. And that's simply not true. That's not what the authors are saying. This is straight up dishonesty. This is scholarship. This is uh, dishonest scholarship. Um, if a student did a paper in, my, in one of my classes and they quoted a passage like this and basically manipulated the quote in order to remove the part that they found problematic for their own message, they would fail. Um, or at the very least, well, it depends on the class, but it, certainly in an advanced class, they would fail. And uh, they would certainly be penalized. And Dr. Campbell has taught nursing for 30 years. He's uh, taught nursing education, I think 30, maybe even more. He's, he's an experienced person. He's not ignorant. He's certainly not stupid. So I don't understand any uh, charitable way of interpreting his blatant misrepresentation of this passage. How, how could he do it honestly? Um, and the answer is, I think he can't. Uh, so that's where we are. Well, I don't want to make this video too long. So let's quickly outline the rest of this video um, and walk through uh, what remains. Okay, so uh, what I want to provide is a bit of context. So part of this context is about case reports and case series. Uh, and I'm going to use something called the clinical evidence period or the hierarchy of clinical evidence, which is widely taught um, in uh, basically everybody who studies evidence-based medicine, but also uh, research methods. Um, I'll, secondly, I'll highlight, as I have in other videos, the role of poster abstracts uh, in the scientific and medical literature. Uh, I'll do a brief discussion of multiple sclerosis and COVID-19, which uh, hopefully will help put the abstract in context. Um, and then I want to actually highlight uh, some of what came out of that meeting uh, as picked up by the attendees themselves. I didn't attend the meeting. It's not my area of specialty, uh, but I think we can get a sense of that from other meeting attendees. And then we'll do a wrap up. Okay, so here's, this is something uh, I brought, I got this from Wikipedia, but frankly, you can Google search a hierarchy of evidence or the evidence, clinical evidence pyramid, and you'll get something like this. Uh, this is uh, very widely used when you teach research methods or you teach evidence-based medicine uh, to medical students. Um, you, you teach 
this, basically, something like this. Uh, they vary a little bit. Colors vary and so on. There's, you can see several examples on Wikipedia. I picked this one. Uh, I think this is from the Canadian Oncology Society or something. But um, at any rate, uh, what you see here is this, is this pyramid. At the top are uh, basically the most authoritative, um, uh, intended to be at any rate, the most authoritative uh, uh, lines of evidence. And towards the bottom are the bricks that are used to build up that evidence uh, or build up those those lines of reasoning on those inferences. And you'll see now at near the bottom, just above background information and expert opinion, you'll see case series and case reports. Um, depending on the way the hierarchy of evidence is presented, in clinical hierarchies of evidence, uh, this is generally at the bottom. In non-clinical hierarchies of evidence, uh, you, you don't see them, um, or they play a different role, depending on the area of specialization. Um, here's another one, a hierarchy of evidence, which does not use a pyramid um, uh, imaging. Uh, so here, this is, so it was originally published in 1995 for um, clinical evidence. And here's another one. This is a, a more recent paper. I think this is from 10 or 15 years ago. But you can see, again, at the top, systematic reviews and meta-analyses of, re, of uh, randomized clinical trials with definitive results are at the top. And then down at the bottom are case reports. So what are case reports? What are case reports or case series? Generally considered, well, as you can see, the weakest, most unfiltered type of new clinical evidence. So if you have the evidence pyramid, at the very bottom are things like expert opinion. But if you're generating new evidence, one type of evidence that you might have is a case report. So a case report is basically a, a report on an individual patient. Um, so you might, and you'll, you'll see them in journals. You'll see them in clinical journals. Uh, you'll see them in some clinical journals that are specialized for different uh, diseases. You'll see them also in, uh, uh, in journals. Uh, it's actually quite, if you're a medical student and you want to publish a paper, Doing a case report is, is a pretty easy way to get a pa paper published, frankly. If you see a patient that you think merits a case report, you can write up a case report and, and get, that, uh, get that thing published. Very short. And they're basically informing other uh, clinicians, I saw this. And so you might want to look out and see it yourself or see if you see something like it. And then on that basis, maybe in the future, you might do some studies. Uh, now, a case series is more than one case report. In this particular abstract of that poster, they do provide some additional information um, on the cell types and so on. Uh, and it is also a series. It's, it's about two patients, not one patient. Um, uh, but it's still just that. It's, just, it's a case series. Um, now I don't want to. I want to. I don't want to disparage uh, case reports or case series. They're important. They're important when developing a clinical understanding, and also they're important for kind of thinking up what kind of new research you might want to do. Uh, generally speaking, I think of case reports and case series as being done by clinicians or clinician researchers for clinicians. They give people an idea of maybe what to look out for. Okay, so now let's talk about poster abstracts. I've covered this in other videos, um, and uh, basically they, they should not be taken out into the public and, and used to in, uh, uh, make claims about uh, the progress of science. Um, they're often preliminary work in progress. They're really useful for networking with other scientists in the same area. Um, they're usually not substantially peer-reviewed except to be you know, presented at the meeting in the first place. Um, they're ripe for misinformation. Um, so I want to also, also give a little bit of background about multiple sclerosis and COVID-19. Dr. Campbell described a little bit about multiple sclerosis. It's not my specialty um, at all. I um, am not a, a neuroscientist. I have published uh, a fair amount of work, research work in the last five years uh, in a collaborative effort with a neuroscientist um, and that's been an ALS, another type of sclerosis, but quite different. Um, 
uh, you may know it as Lou Gehrig's disease or the disease that Stephen Hawking had. Uh, multiple sclerosis is a neurodegenerative disease. ALS is also a, neurodeg a neurodegenerative disease. Other neurodegenerative diseases that you've surely heard of are things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, and so on. But multiple sclerosis is a neurological autoimmune disease. So those other diseases, ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, they are not autoimmune diseases. They're neurodegenerative diseases, but not autoimmune. There are other neurological autoimmune diseases but the most common is multiple sclerosis. But the other ones might include things like neuromyelitis optica, or NMO, um, antimyelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody disease. So oligodendrocytes are a type of cell that's involved in producing a lot of things for um, other cells in the central nervous system. It has a variety of roles. Um, so, and there are others. Okay, so there are a variety of, of uh, neurological autoimmune diseases, but the most common of, of all of those is multiple sclerosis. Now, that autoimmune component distinguishes these diseases from other diseases, other neurodegenerative diseases, uh, when talking about COVID, because when you have COVID or other diseases with a, a substantial immune component or inflammatory component, uh, you have to consider whether, for example, the medication that you're taking for the autoimmune disease is going to have some interaction with the treatment that you might have for COVID. And you also have to consider whether things that might spark the immune system um, in uh, a person without an, an autoimmune disease might spark something different in somebody with an autoimmune disease. So they're at, both at special vulnerability for COVID um, and also at, uh, uh, they have other issues to consider with regard to the treatment that they may be taking uh, for the autoimmune um, aspect of the, of the condition, uh, say multiple sclerosis. So it's this, it's this complex um, interplay between all these things and it shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, I wanna highlight a couple of things from the meeting itself. So if we look at the meeting, so here's a, uh, uh, a nice uh, pay, uh, bit on the multiple sclerosis blog. This is highlights from the meeting um, taken relatively soon after the meeting. And, you know, there were just about 9,000 participants, 1,700 abstracts and 200 speakers. There was a lot presented. This, the paper that we're or the abstract that we're considering today that John Campbell wrote his, did his, uh, his piece about is one of those 1700 abstracts. And I haven't been able to find it highlighted, uh, although the researchers are, are considered, you know, excellent researchers in the field, I haven't seen it highlighted as, as, a, as a highlight of the meeting. And it's not like the meeting was a secret. You know, there are 9,000 people combing the floors. They all know where to find the, the posters if they want to go see them. So there was quite a lot on pediatric multiple sclerosis, progressive MS, so the genetic links, so genetic um, components to progression, disease severity, uh, advances in MS treatment and preventions. I have to say this is one of the things that is happening. There are developments in treatment that are uh, quite uh, promising and, um, and have, have appeared. Uh, pregnancy in MS and COVID-19 in MS. Now, there was quite a bit on COVID-19 vaccination. So um, there's, uh, uh, and there, there are people taking these um, other things, take, if people are taking disease modifying therapies, DMTs, uh, they might have some effects on the immune system of those individuals. And so there are issues for them with vaccinations and so on. There were, I, I looked through some of the abstracts, there were lots of abstracts on just these issues. There were abstracts on uh, myelination and, um, and, and vaccination or myelination and COVID. So these are not issues that are, uh, that are um, surprising in some sense. They're not out of the expectations. Um, they're, they're, there's, this is an area of active research. It shouldn't be something that people get frightened of, 
about. It shouldn't be something that people think, oh, if I take a vaccine, I'm going to develop MS. Um, if you get COVID, you're more likely to develop an autoimmune disease than if you take the vaccine. Um, that's one of the highlights here. Um, so I haven't been able to find anything other than the last week or two where somehow this got picked up by this particular abstract got picked up by uh, folks who would lean very strongly towards the anti-vax um, outlook. And they've picked this up and seen it as something very important. And I think when Dr. Campbell said it was just appeared last week by the WHO, I, I don't know where he first saw it. I doubt he was combing the abstract book because he didn't seem to know it was a meeting abstract. So it seems to have been something that he must have picked up from one of those um, kind of fringe sources. I don't know, perhaps he can say. Uh, okay, so let's go back and I want to highlight just one, one or two more things here. Um, so that's the meeting. Didn't show up so much from the meeting. Uh, uh, Dr. Campbell also um, had some kind of snarky comments on mi misrepresentation and the fact checkers, the AP fact checkers. And what I want to point out here is that the AP fact checkers who have said that post mi misrepresent research on multiple sclerosis and COVID-19 vaccines found in a WHO database, those fact checkers were absolutely correct. Those misrepresentations are misrepresentations, they're falsehoods, and Dr. Campbell has unfortunately continued those. Even after reading the fact checking, he's continued to make the same misrepresentations and to state the same falsehoods about um, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this poster abstract. Uh, quite uh, disappointing. Um, importantly, so th this particular one goes into some of the things that were, this is an, a piece that was highlighted by Dr. Campbell, or that was mentioned by Dr. Campbell, and it actually addresses some of the same things that I've discussed here, but also some of the same things that he has repeated in his own video, even after seeing this. So he points out that, um, for example, let's see here. The screenshots circulating on social media show an abstract from research that can be found on the WHO's uh, global, let's see if I can make that a little bit bigger. Can I do that? Is that going to work? Nope. Okay. That's not working today. Uh, it's global COVID-19 research database, but it's not a paper that was produced or officially endorsed by the WHO, despite Dr. Campbell saying, it, he must have said it a couple of dozen times at least a dozen times that it's WHO is saying this. Not true. Uh, it has examined uh, two cases of multiple sclerosis. Okay. Um, they go on with some other people here, but actually let's talk about the authors. Roland Martin, a neurology professor, says the work showed that the vaccine was related to the onset of MS, at least in the two patients studied. But he conceded that the Wording of the abstract is, quote, probably too strong since there are many other possible causes for MS, including genetic predisposition. More importantly, he says, this issue is very important, and I hope that the usefulness of the vaccines will not be questioned by I, our observations, as there is no doubt that the risks for triggering MS are higher with the natural infection based on current data. Um, and... Uh, then there's a bit more about the other things and then uh, about uh, uh, more research to be conducted. Uh, Vice President at the National Multiple Sclerosis Society makes the abstract's introduction makes it clear that other research has found that the type of nervous system damage caused by MS occurs more often after COVID infection than after COVID vaccination. This is the exact passage that Dr. Campbell left out without indication. Um, and then um, the publisher makes some things and men, uh, makes some comments and mentions the same things that we've just discussed here, which is that conference abstracts 
are informational purposes. They're basically scientist to scientist, incomplete research and are used to get feedback or find collaborators. Not peer reviewed in any manner and the publication of an abstract does not equate to publication of a paper or poster presented in the conference session. Um, really disappointed um, in uh, what has happened here. And my view is that um, uh, Dr. Campbell knows better or should know better. Okay, so what we have, hopefully, what, what we're all on, the, hopefully you should all be on the same page about here is that um, this thing has been blown entirely out of proportion and not just out of proportion, but taken out of context, done so at, in the full light of day. So there's no, I, I can't see any reason why this should have happened. Um, I can't see any uh, benign or charitable interpretation of this kind of misrepresentation. Uh, Dr. Campbell is perhaps not an expert in neurodegenerative diseases, but he's been around. He knows what conferences are for. He knows what conference abstracts are for. He knows what conference posters are for. And he knows uh, what um, he knows. He had information about the fact checking beforehand. Um, and yet he still not only made just uh, almost absurd mistakes about uh, WHO and reinforcing that w this falsehood that WHO actually stated this, that this was a WHO circular, all these other things which are not true. He then went on to talk about how this thing might have been taken down from a database, which it has not. It wasn't, I mean, it's in this, it's in this database, it's in the multiple sclerosis journal. Um, it is just such an egregious misrepresentation of this. Um, I've been thinking about doing a series of videos on critical thinking, and uh, I think it may be necessary because what is happening here, what is happening in this kind of misrepresentation um, that has been done with this, with this poster abstract is kind of critical, anti, it's anti-critical thinking. Um, it is, uh, uh, is it lazy? Is it mendacious? Maybe it's both. Um, but it is the kind of thing that encourages people, I'm afraid, to believe falsehoods about the way science operates, um, the way clinical results operate, and how clinical understanding progresses through not just research. We don't find everything out all in advance, but you also have to do uh, casework and case reports and uh, discover what avenues are important to pursue in the future. At any rate, I'm back from hibernation. So um, if you've stuck it this far, thanks very much. And I will see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.